chances are you don't think you're very important. You're not a president, celebrity or leader of an international company. I want to tell a story in which you are the main character. You're a citizen of a global industrialized civilization. Its development over the past few hundred years has transformed the lives of billions of people and in doing so, the rest of the planet. We now know that the fossil fuels we burn as part of our daily lives are changing the Earth's climate. What you do with this knowledge makes you one of the most important people in all of human history because you have the chance to change how we power our civilization and so avoid dangerous climate change. So far, only a very small section of our society truly understands the scale of the changes required and how little time we have left to make them. This is a film about the race against climate change and why what you do over the next 20 years will be so crucial. I'm Dr. James Dyke. I'm a lecturer in sustainability science here at the University of Southampton. A large part of my day job involves thinking about climate change. What's driving it and how it may affect us now and far into the future. So you may think I'm something of an expert about climate change. But there's another type of climate change. What it means to me, my family and friends and pretty much everything else I care about. To be honest with you, I did a pretty good job of keeping these two sorts of climate change separate because I didn't really want to think things through. Denier is a label that we sometimes throw at people who dispute the fact that humans are changing the climate. But I think I was in something of denial myself. It's taken me some time to realise what we must do to avert disaster. In this film, I will go behind the headlines and show you just how urgent the situation is and the alarming assumptions that lie at the heart of all government's proposed solutions. But this is a story of hope. I've seen that the UK is ideally placed to lead the required technological and social revolutions that could produce not just a stable climate, but a better society. Along the way I've met the scientists, economists, entrepreneurs, activists and citizens that are at the forefront of transforming the UK. After all of that, you will understand what climate change means, what it really means. It's not about saving the planet. It's actually more ambitious than that. Our society has grown up, has invested, has assumed that climate is going to be static, that sea level is not going to rise too fast, that patterns of rainfall are not going to change, that the the temperatures are basically going to stay the same. We have a hundred million people living within one meter of sea level rise. We have trillions, tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of investments within one meter of sea level rise. And that is investment that we're going to lose if we allow climate change to proceed under the worst case scenario. If we think about human well-being, it depends upon two key things. It depends upon meeting the needs and the rights of everybody in the world to health, water, education, housing. And that depends upon the health of our planet on a stable climate, healthy oceans, fertile soil, a protective ozone layer. If we don't protect this phenomenal, unique living planet on which we live, we have no chance of meeting our needs and having a thriving economy. We have to start to look at these together and realize that the living planet is the source of all of our sustenance. La révolution pour le changement climatique. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté.
let's say that the international community takes its responsibility seriously and we do manage to limit warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. Mm. How long have we got to put in place the changes required, in given our current rates of emissions, let's say? Our current rates of emissions probably would, would have about 20 years to use up all of the carbon budget for two degrees C of warming. What the science makes really clear is that for any particular temperature, we can, we can put a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's like if you like a carbon budget, it's like having your salary for the month, and that's how, how much we can spend. And if we carry on spending at the moment, at the current rate, 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, we've got at the most 20 years. Okay. And, then, and then no more emissions after that. But let's be clear, at one and a half and two degrees C, for, uh, I mean, that is a dangerous temperature threshold for many people on the planet. And if it's certainly at two degrees C, many people will die. They'll be poor, they'll live a long way from the northern hemisphere that's caused most of the problem. They'll typically be non-whites. So far, our actions have led to an increase of one degree Celsius globally. That doesn't sound like very much, but as we continue to put more greenhouse gases in the air and trap more energy from the sun, the climate will respond with more extreme heat waves, more sea level rise, more destructive storms, more floods in some places and droughts elsewhere. We will have to adapt to the climate change we've already put in place, but if the climate warms beyond 2 degrees Celsius, we won't be able to keep up with these accelerating impacts. This is why the international community established a guardrail of 2 degrees of warming. Similar to a fence keeping unwary travellers away from a dangerous cliff edge, the 2 degrees limit was intended to balance the need to continue to grow economies while reducing the risk that such growth could produce disastrous environmental change. So there are technological fixes to some aspects of climate change. But these things aren't free, and they're not going to do it everywhere, right? So some places will, will have the barriers. London will have a new barrier. New York may have a new barrier. But Shanghai won't. Bangladesh won't. Calcutta won't. Shenzhen won't. Because it's not appropriate. Like They're not in positions where these things can work. And the problem with building a barrier is that you minimize the damages now and everybody's happy until it gets overtopped and then you're actually setting yourself up for an even bigger bill later on. And we've done that an enormous amount of times. And if we try to adapt to a moving target, what we're doing is in fact just wasting our money. The winters of 2013, 14 and 2015, 16 saw a series of major storms batter the UK. These produced widespread flooding and caused billions of pounds in damage to roads, bridges, homes and businesses. It's impossible to say that climate change caused such storms, but there is an increasing amount of research that clearly shows that climate change loads the dice towards warmer and wetter winters in the UK, which will increase the chance of such extreme weather in the future. What were previously considered to be once in a hundred year storms will occur more frequently. Many think the principal challenge is just swapping out current fossil fuel power stations, coal and gas, for wind turbines or arguably nuclear. But that misunderstands the, the challenge that we face. Firstly, only about 20% of the energy we currently consume is actually electricity. 80% of it is not electricity. And if we're serious about decarbonizing the energy system, we have to make much more of our energy system electric, probably near 80%. So we need to significantly increase the amount of electricity that we actually generate. In order for us to avoid dangerous climate change, we need to figure out how to power this city and the rest of our civilization with renewable energy. That's a colossal challenge because it requires the transformation of our energy infrastructure within a couple of decades. Now, many would assume that that might be actually impossible and that it would be foolhardy for us to even try. We want to show you that that's not true. 
The United Kingdom can stop burning coal, oil and gas to provide heat and power and it can do that at the same time as keeping the lights on. That doesn't depend on science fiction technologies or magical thinking, but it will require some imagination. Our economy is currently based on a need to grow, whether or not it makes us thrive. Climate change, I believe, is making us realise that we need an economy that makes us thrive, whether or not it grows. So it's a fundamental mind flip. You know, the, the UK has a history of being at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. And what we're looking for now is a new green industrial and social revolution. And the UK has all the financial wherewithal and the intellectual wherewithal and this huge renewable potential to be, to be demonstrating at a world level what real leadership is. The Zero Carbon Report paints quite a, an optimistic vision of the United Kingdom, but are we going to get there in time? Are we going to be able to transform the UK by 2040? Well, the forces that shape our lives exist on many different levels, but the research we've been doing over the past 10 years has been looking at have we got all the tools and technologies, or oh, are we waiting for another eco-widget to be developed before we can do this? We've shown clearly we have all the tools and technologies we need to get to net zero within a couple of decades. We're not waiting for anything. We have everything at our disposal. The question is, do we have the will to do it? The UK has the best potential for wind power in Europe, and its rapid development now sees it generate around 15% of the UK's total electricity demand. Over the past 10 years, electricity generated by solar panels in the UK has increased 10 times. I went to see some of these pioneering projects to better understand how they're disrupting the energy system. The QE2 floating installation just outside London is, I mean, it's pretty much like the rest of our um, large solar plants, except for one particular point, um, and that's the fact that it actually floats on the Queen Elizabeth II reservoir which is, you know, is quite unique. In fact, um, in terms of um, uh, its uniqueness, it is the first, um, world's first deep water floating um, solar park. It's 6.3 megawatts. Now to the layman, that doesn't mean very much. So in layman speak, that's about 18, enough to power about 1800 houses. This is probably not the answer that people expect, but the reason why renewables are going to continue to grab market share and become the pre pre predominant producer of electricity is not because it's green and it's not because people you know, have this social conscience, although clearly they do, some of them do. Um, it's because of price. An increased deployment will only continue to drive down price. And I'm sorry, if I'm able to deliver electricity cheaper than coal or oil or gas, they will come with me. Westmill is a cooperatively owned and managed wind farm. So how does that work? How does the cooperative function? Well, it functions in many ways like a, another wind farm. We uh, employ people to service and maintain the turbines and monitor them. But we also have a board of directors who are elected by the members. So the members get a say in who's running the co-op. And they also get a say in how the profits are distributed. And it's, so it's one person, one vote. And that's a very important uh, principle, depending, you know, regardless of how many chairs you might offer or, or have, uh, that it's one person, one vote. So there's a real sense of community participation with this facility? There is a lot of participation and we get a lot of people who still come along to our AGM where a conventional sort of uh, share offer might, might be a bit duller. And people in the community have also been involved in trials of new ways of setting power between themselves uh, from the solar that they generate on their own houses. So a real interest locally. And lots of people like to come and visit. We have a whole set of volunteer guides who enjoy talking about it as I am now. The projects that we visited demonstrates that the United Kingdom can be powered by low carbon electricity. We have the technology and community run and operated wind and solar farms demonstrates that we have the will. Given the opportunity, people can organise themselves and invest their time, 
energy and money into building the solutions that we need to avoid dangerous climate change. This needs to happen faster. Unfortunately, changes to the planning process has made onshore wind extremely challenging and there have been reductions in the financial support for solar. Neither of these developments will kill these emerging technologies, but they are slowing down its deployment at a time when we need it to be happening faster than ever. For that to happen, the enthusiasm and commitment of individuals, communities and organisations needs to be matched with political action. So why is there such a large gap between the political rhetoric of what they say we're going to do and what the physics seems to demand that we do? Well, this isn't actually directly the policymakers' fault. This is very much that a certain cadre within the scientific community, and uh, these are certain types of modelers that bring together the economics and the science to, you know, together, um, they've suggested that the best way we can deal with this is to have in the future a technology for removing carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere, a negative emission technology. Now these technologies do not exist, so they're sort of postulating these as some future option. And they're saying, well if we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in huge quantities in the future, then we haven't got to reduce our emissions quite so quickly today. Which of course is very appealing to policymakers, but the, and to the rest of us as well. We can carry on going on holiday and carry on living our lives as we are today, knowing that some future technology that does not currently exist will solve the problem for us. But given the tremendous importance of these negative emissions technologies, people might be rather surprised to learn that they don't really exist yet. Well, they don't exist. Firstly, they do not exist. So there, is, there are no even moderate scale and negative emission technologies that work anywhere on the planet at the moment. Um, but more disturbing to me, as well as that, is that they are the basis of every single two degree C scenario that was submitted to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the UN body that has the, brings together the expert, world expertise on climate change. So every single two degree scenario that they have assumes that these negative emission technologies will work at huge scale in the future and therefore they provide a, a much more rosy, glossy picture that the policymakers like to, like to see. It is, ultimately, it is a moral hazard. We are relying on these technologies. It's not that the technologies are necessarily bad. We should be researching, we should be developing them. But to assume that they work is a moral hazard. It's an incredibly dangerous thing to do that we're going to pass on to future generations. You know, there's significant risk these te technologies will not work. And if they do not work, then they will, we will be bequeathing them a temperature of 3, 4, 5 degrees C future. We've tried everything except for actual mitigation. So 27 years after the first IPCC report, we still haven't been prepared to grasp the nettle to start to um, significantly reduce our emissions. Rather than making the required reductions in greenhouse gas emissions now, the international community has put its faith in future negative emissions technologies because this means economic growth is not threatened. We are still locked into the worldview that growth will eventually solve all of humanity's problems and so politicians continue to be largely judged on whether their policies increase the size of economies. What this means is that mainstream economic theory is stuck on a collision course with the climate and we don't have much time to turn it around. Yeah, it's a great question. Why is mainstream economic theory so resilient in the face of financial crisis, climate change, extraordinary levels of inequality? I believe it's because it is incredibly convenient for vested interests who are profiting from this current system. And actually, if you look at the mainstream theories that students are being taught, it really fits very well with neoliberal thinking, which says that the market is efficient, so let it get to work. That the state apparently is incompetent, so don't let it meddle. The commons are tragic, so sell them off. The society, well, it doesn't exist, so don't worry about it. That the household economy, it's domestic, leave it to the women. With this kind of script, we end up with a very narrow, market-based, competitive economic theory. It works very well for those neoliberal interests and, and the powers that be. If we're going to transform it so we recognize climate change and extreme inequality, we need to rewrite that script and come up with an economic theory that fits the 21st century. So the challenge today is that the economics that students are learning 
and that policy is being driven by that's been discussed in our parliaments and written about in the media, it's based on the textbooks of 1950. And those in turn are actually based on the theories back from 1850. Economic theory is literally centuries out of date. It's no wonder that the students at universities are rebelling because they know that what they're being taught is in no way equipping them for this future. Because the economy is constantly evolving, we can all be like little butterflies that trigger off a bigger effect. We can all be part of building a critical mass to change the economy. In a way, we're all economists because we're all shaping the way our household is evolving. So we can ask ourselves, if I want to be part of creating an economy that works for all, that is distributive and regenerative, how does the way that I shop, eat and travel affect that? How does the way that I bank, invest, volunteer, demonstrate, all these ways that I'm actually contributing that and making sure that we don't get portrayed just as a consumer, which is again a very neoliberal, narrow way of who we are. We are not consumers, we're citizens, we're neighbours, we're demonstrators, we're voters, we're volunteers and in this lies all of the richness of the way that we contribute to the new economy. Well, what we've been doing is modelling for the past 10 years in increasing detail the fact that we have all the technologies and how many wind turbines we'll need and how much buildings we have to insulate. The new report that we've just launched, Zero Carbon Making It Happen, looks at the different barriers, the psychological, the sociological, the legal, the economic barriers, and every time we've found good research that shows how we can do it. We have all the tools we need and we know how we can overcome all the barriers, we just have to pull it all together and find the will to do it. There are dappled rays of a zero carbon future, here, now, in the present. It's all there, it's not something that we can't see. It's here, there and everywhere. We just imagine over time all of those dappled rays joining up and becoming the new normal, and then we have zero carbon Britain. Where we're headed in 2100, under a business as usual, burn all the fossil fuel scenario, is going to be a different planet and one in which we have no experience of as a society. Things are being pushed in certain directions and we are seeing amplifying effects that make them worse. We can see these changes pretty much everywhere we look. The changes in the acidity of the ocean because of so much carbon going into the ocean are affecting coral reefs now. The bleaching events that we had in 2016 are unprecedented in any observations that we had. The Barrier Reef in Australia, one of the great natural wonders, half of it was totally devastated this year. Like it's going to take years to recover if indeed it does. We are changing things and you don't need to be a scientist to see these things changing. If we don't do anything, it's going to remove that safe niche for feeding 9 billion people on the planet. It's going to cause international fragmentation, building of walls, international wars over resources, holding back water. It's a very, very, very much more turbulent future if we don't do anything. The easiest and simplest path to keeping life recognisable is to actually make the changes that the physics demands that we do. Increasing risks going forward in a business as usual scenario are equivalent to us as a society playing Russian roulette 
with ever more chambers filled with a bullet and us holding it to our children's head. So I think about this kind of change on two tracks. The first is that we need to use all the economic institutions incentives we have right now, like taxes and feed-in tariffs and government investment in long-term green infrastructure to start making that future happen now. We need to use the current economic system as it is. But it's the second track that I'm excited about because by 2040 and hopefully a long time before then, the students who enroll to study economics Let's go back to the roots. Economics, it means household management. And who could want to be a student of anything more necessary than that? Household management for the 21st century. So those students should know that they are learning about our full household, the economy within society, within the living world, and that they're being taught an economic mindset and the tools and the creativity to go out and create a thriving UK economy for the 21st century. So I want to see different textbooks with new diagrams and new ideas at the heart of them, ones that will actually make the founding fathers of economics proud of us today. A lot of people think of leadership has just been about the, the policy makers and the prime ministers, but it's not. Leadership occurs whether it's in our family, in our institutions, our universities, our places of work. Um, and what we need is that leadership at all of these different levels, all these different tiers. The role of the policy makers is to see where that leadership has been successful elsewhere and then to scale that up to work across the whole of society. So ultimately, this is a partnership between top down and bottom up. And if you have that partnership, I still think we have a, a chance of holding to the two degree C framing of the Paris Commitment. This is not something that can be solved only at a global scale. Yes, you do need these international agreements, but you also need the same thing at progressively smaller scales, all the way down, back down to the local scale. Everyone needs to be involved in this, from, an, from a single household to small groups, to cities, to states, and so on and so forth. And so what you need to do is polycentric governance. Despite inaction by the US government, cities and states across North America are joining voluntary schemes that will reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Many corporations are reducing their carbon footprints as they realize that climate change threatens future profits. 350.org is helping build grassroots campaigns that directly address climate change while Transition Towns inspires local people to build sustainable communities they would love to live in. The key to these and thousands of other climate change actions across the world is the realization that we all ultimately benefit from a stable climate. This is polycentric governance at work. By joining with others, we can affect change where we can while continuing to press for effective action at other scales. Climate change is just incredibly frightening to, to me and so that's why I get involved in community projects really because I want to try and do something about it um, in a meaningful way. So how are you responding to climate change? What, what are you doing? My response to climate change is all about community action um, and activity at a, a city and a neighbourhood level. A lot of the solutions have to come from the community. We have to understand climate change better, we have to learn from and with each other about it and we have to think about opportunities for behaviour change and we also have to think very much about the positive difference that tackling climate change can make to our lives. I've been inspired by almost everywhere I look in the place where I live. Um, transition towns are running some amazing projects locally. Um, there are creatives organising um, festivals to celebrate all sorts of different elements of our, our community. Um, and there are arts and heritage activities happening everywhere. 
uh, I think it's amazing and I think people would be astounded if they knew how much positive sustainable action is happening in, in cities and towns across the world. As well as emitting an awful lot of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, there are also significant health impacts of the numbers of car and truck van journeys that we make. Just how bad is it in our cities? In certain parts of London, they actually exceeded their particulate emissions within the first, for the whole year in the first five days. Um, and it's important to note that that's not just uh, from the fumes that are spewing out the back of the cars, but it's also from tire wear, it's from using brakes, you know, so even if we're looking for a future, having replacing like for like with electric vehicles isn't going to be the full solution. We have to look at things differently and that's why livable cities are so important. So what happens often is it's a kind of if you build it they will come scenario. You build more roads, people fill up the roads because it seems a bit more convenient. Same with cycle infrastructure. You build really good cycle infrastructure, more cyclists will turn up. Um, but it's also rethinking that, that public space. Those public spaces could be transformed uh, by building high quality cycle infrastructure, by putting in dedicated public transport networks. It could be by creating parks where there used to be roads. I mean, there's an awful lot of options available to us, but it's going to take a bit of political will and it's going to take a change in mindset that actually people in cities deserve better. When it comes to our personal contributions to climate change, there is one activity that is often overlooked. We know that flying is incredibly damaging. We should insulate our homes, use energy saving devices and drive less. But there is something we all do every day that adds up to one of the largest drivers of climate change. And most people are unaware of just how important it is. Well, people are often surprised to hear that the food that you eat, or sometimes throw away, accounts for between 20 and 30% of your overall carbon footprint. So nearly a third of all greenhouse gas contributions come from food. Why is that so large? To a large extent, we've become used to eating meat in the developed world, and meat has a high carbon footprint attached to it, often due to the methane that ruminant animals like cows produce, and also it's the key driver of deforestation globally, so cutting down all those trees that used to absorb CO2. And when you look forward, this is a big worry because the latest World Resources Institute estimate is that the amount of meat we're gonna consume is gonna go up by 95% by 2050 because countries like China are gonna become affluent enough to demand it like we currently do. So given that food's impact on climate change is so large, what can we do to reduce that? The biggest thing that meat eaters can do is reduce how much meat they eat, or even just switch from beef and lamb, the really high carbon footprint meats, to pork and chicken, which only have about one third of the carbon footprint. So people often ask me what the carbon footprint of their diet is, and I show this chart to illustrate that no matter what your starting point is, everybody can take one step down and it makes a meaningful reduction in their overall food carbon footprint. We could all eat sustainable diets by 2040. What it would look like is we don't waste too much food. We don't fly things around the world and eat out of season. And the main thing is we have a low meat diet. In order to get to a, a decarbonised 2040, then we have to start today. And the implications are that, of that are going to be very significant for our society. It will have to become a much fairer society because the majority of emissions come from a relatively small percentage of the population. That particular group, which will include people like myself, will have to make some very rapid and radical changes to how we live our lives. But I think climate change and responding to the challenges of climate change is a real opportunity to overcome both you know, the environmental issues and some of the equity and social issues that have, that have arisen in the last few decades. 
Once we can unpick the perception management around climate, so we don't see it as just a thing for lefties, but see it as a, a collective challenge that crosses race, cross boundaries, cross borders, it's something that matters to us all. That unleashes a sense of collective purpose way beyond the Apollo programme that goes right across the world that will give us the sense of collective purpose that we've been yearning for for well over a generation. It's so easy to get overwhelmed by the number of barriers and challenges that we could see to creating this new vision. Whether it's the mainstream financial system that is working hard to keep itself in power and, and accumulating the gains of the current economic structure. But I'm inspired by Buckminster Fuller, who said, if you want to change something, don't fight the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I passionately believe that while some of us focus on challenging those barriers to change, others have to focus on building that new model, speaking to it, drawing its pictures, finding its language, speaking richly about a new economic story. We have to bring forth that new economy because it's already there. Speak about it, join it, contribute to it. That's where I think we're going to overcome those challenges. This journey has shown me that climate change is real and represents a serious risk to everything that we care about. But I've also seen that solutions do exist. We have the answers and people are already transforming food, energy, transport and policy. To achieve the required transformations within a couple of decades appears an impossible task. And right now we're not doing enough. To keep our children safe, to allow our civilization to flourish, we need all sectors of society to play their part. We need everyone involved. We need you.